live on YouTube. Hey, everyone, how's it going? As you guys are settling in, hey, Emily, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, good, yeah. Good, well, we've got, looks like, um, yeah, looks like we're started up and make sure that, are you visible? No, wait, gallery view. Make sure that I can see. Oh, okay, we're in speaker view, so it's toggling back and forth between us. So what I'm gonna do is just set it to gallery view. Welcome everyone to tonight's session. Um, as you're coming into the chat, let us know where you're coming from, what questions you have. I have Emily Glankler from Antisocial Studies uh, here. If you do not currently subscribe to her channel, you will need to, um, because she has all these videos that break down each point of the rubric in depth, like a more structured, uh, version of what we're going to do right now. But we're getting so many questions. I'm like, what do I do with contextualization? Like, is one sentence enough? No. Like, <laughs> what do you do? And so we're going to go over that tonight. Um, and as you guys come in again, I'll, I'll be fielding some of the questions for us. Emily, also on her website on antisocialstudies.org, tell us about um, all the cool stuff that you have on your website that I can go down. Yeah. With. So I've been um, posting, I have a whole page for WAP exam resources. I can show y'all if that's, I'll share my screen real quick. Yeah. Um, so if, if you go to antisocialstudies.org, you will see a page that says WAP resources and then AP exam resources. And so this is where it's not super organized because I'm like throwing everything on here as fast as I can, <laughs> but this is where I'm throwing a lot of information. So I've been doing these YouTube cram sessions where I go over like a whole time period in an hour. And so I'm posting my PowerPoints and recordings. Um, there's a lot of things here. There's a lot of like a link to the Marco learning study guides, a lot of like notes, templates that I've made. But for our purposes, somewhere on here, here we go for writing practice. Um, in addition, I have made some practice DBQs, but I've also made like an updated rubric for the five document DBQ um, that you have access to. The only thing I will say, I'm learning this the hard way, is that a lot of students are trying to access these. And I think if you're doing it through your school email, some of your school networks like won't let you like download weird documents from other places. And so you might want to access it with your personal email. But anyway. That's good advice. Yeah. And I mean, so you've clearly been sitting around doing nothing, Emily. Yeah. Um, just like. <laughs> totally bored. Your, your, your school, what, you guys finished up this week? Is that right? No, no, we're still in class and then we have like finals next week. So uh, like our last week of school. So teaching online is fun, plus l streaming live on your channel. And um, when is your next live, by the way? Uh, tomorrow. I'm doing it every day at 4, 3 central. Okay. Mm -hmm. 4 slash 3 central. Um, good. Now, that's, so this is the, the uh, rubric that we're going to type in the, um, the, into the chat, the, uh, the link to your website mm -hmm. where you guys can get all of this. Um, and in fact, maybe um, I'll get one of our, our moderators to, to do, to do this, but let's yeah, just go right through Emily, like why, what is the 10 point rubric? Just assume we haven't dealt with it. And like, yeah. why, what is context? So yeah, the 10 point rubric, nothing's changed and everything has changed. So like if you have been practicing all year with the old DBQ rubric, it's all the same stuff, but it's just for different amounts and that might sort of change your strategy. So um, in general, right, context and thesis are things you typically find in your intro paragraph. That's kind of the most traditional way um, teachers teach this, which I, that's how I teach it. Um, context is basically showing that you can zoom out of the prompt and you understand other things that are going on. So the way I like to think of it is when you have a prompt, you have different keywords that are kind of your parameters. So let's say your prompt is like to evaluate the impact of religion on trade networks from 1200 to 1450. So the parameters of your prompt are like religion and trade networks, 1200 to 1450. And so um, context, you want to maybe like zoom out of one of those parameters and show that you can tell us other things going on. So the easiest way is just to zoom out of the time period, to go a little bit earlier, like what was happening before that led to these things that are going on. But a lot of students have been freaking out, like what if the prompt is from 1200 and we didn't learn the stuff before? You can also zoom out of the topic. So if the topic is religion and trade networks, but you wanna talk about other things that are happening in that time period that are impacting that, like the rise of powerful trading states or whatever, right? That then impacts the thing you're gonna talk about either of those count for context. It's just like a zoom out. 
Great. And then, so, so context is fundamentally unchanged then on this mm -hmm. exam. It yeah. should be three-ish, four-ish sentences at the front. And what's the shortest I can write to still get the point? I've seen it done in two, but they're two very efficient sentences that are like packed with specifics. So I think the biggest tip is that you have to be specific. So again, let me, let me pick a different, if you're talking about um, the ideologies that impacted imperialism, European imperialism, your context can't just be like, well, Europe was growing and so they were developing an empire. No, sure. that's what the prompt is already telling you. You would want to go into specifics about like the industrial revolution led to the need for raw materials. And so they looked out into the ocean and they went, right? You want to kind of tell a narrative. I tell my students, this is kind of their one opportunity to be a little bit of a creative writer. A lot of students are taught in like English class to have a hook and all those things. This is sort of your one opportunity to maybe be a little creative with like kind of connecting the story together before you go into your info dump. Wonderful. So the the standard contextualization needs to have enough meat on it to to reward the point and that throughout the ages mankind has thought about the meaning of life like is not enough it's not enough on ap lang which i was just doing a minute ago on our channel um it's not enough for world or euro or a push so then you know you've got the the context first and then thesis point because that's kind of how your first paragraph should go right is that what you recommend yeah, I've sort of formatted this rubric the way I tell my students to format their essay, but of course, there's no point on the rubric for formatting. So like students out there like are asking how many paragraphs does it have to be? It doesn't matter. Like it it really actually doesn't matter. But this is sort of the traditional. So the traditional is the intro paragraph has context, a few sentences of that that leads into your thesis. Um, and then you have your body paragraphs where I have the other points there. So um, but I mentioned there's other ways to get context. You could contextualize your body paragraphs. So if you have maybe two main topics and you want to have a little sentence or two of context before, before you have your topic sentence, that's great too. Um, context can in theory be anywhere, but graders are mostly expecting it to be in the intro. So. Yeah, it's almost like the really obvious way you force the reader to like see like, oh, okay, that's where that goes. And then you back it up with a thesis. The thesis is relatively an easy point to get, right? Like most don't 60, 70% of people get the thesis on DBQs? I believe so. And it, sh it should be, but like you also don't want to like uh, zoom past this one, right? Because I think a lot of students just, this is like a foregone conclusion. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, students know how to write a thesis. The biggest thing is you just have to say something. So, right, like you just, you can't just reword the prompt. So you can't just say religion had an impact on trade routes in this time period. You want to say like, what was the impact, right? And that can still be pretty general, right? It can say like religion grew trade routes or trade routes grew religions. Like, but it, it there needs to be some sort of like verb or some sort of action where you're like, you're saying something that the prompt didn't already say. And as long as you were saying something, then you you typically get that point. And now the question is like, are you gonna then back that up with the documents? That's like a whole other thing, so. Yeah, and so here's a question I have because, so I've, I've, I've set up my contextualization, I hit the thesis with that clear, specific um, response to the prompt. It does help guys to like read and reread the prompt. This is something mm -hmm. that's like a universal fact of test prep because I've been in the test prep world for 18 years. I taught SAT and ACT and AP exams. and why do America's teenagers like to drive a hundred miles an hour past the question they're being asked? So like, people are like, well, I don't know. And they're like on a sheet of ice drive. And they have like, I don't know what the question is. People can write a really great thesis that doesn't actually answer the question in front of them. Right. One, just in parentheses, several people are speculating about how many points, this is a very common right. question we're getting, how many points out of the 10 will convert to a five? And one thing I wanna say that people are missing <coughs> in the discussion is, we know that two readers are going to read your essay. So your, your essay is not going to be scaled zero to 10. It's actually going to be scaled, it's going to be zero to 20. You're going to earn out of a total of 20 oh. points, 10 from one reader, 10 from another. That combined number, 15 out of 20, will then be put on a one through five scale of some kind that they're going to finagle after this is over. We are, by the way, FYI guys, we're going to see at least three world prompts, we're assuming, based on Euro and A push. Um, we will see on AP Lang tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, we will see, at, I'm assuming, at least 15 prompts. We saw at least 15 in lit. <laughs> and then they're going to have to take, and that will be 0 out of 6 times 2, so 0 out of 12, will then get converted to a 
one to five uh, scale. Um, and my understanding, John, tell me if I'm wrong, like my assumption, like I'm going to be a grader this year. My assumption is that I will spend my whole week probably just grading one of the prompts, correct? That's so how it thing, works. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing I've been telling my students is, right, there's a lot of concern of like, oh, you got the easy prompt and you got the hard prompt. But you do have to remember that graders are still, they're grading you only in the vacuum of like your prompt. So if there is a prompt that tends to be more difficult and graders are realizing like, man, they're really struggling with this specific point they might become a little bit more lenient on what they'll accept um, as opposed to a prompt that maybe is a little bit easier and they're kind of expecting that you have a little more information. So I know there's this feeling that like some prompts will be easier than others and there are definitely some you'll feel more comfortable on, but just know the graders aren't comparing apples and oranges. So like your essay will be graded relative to everyone else who had your same prompt. Exactly. That's exactly right. So there's there's a real assurance. Like if you got a hard prompt, so do the other people with the hard prompt. And like mm -hmm. your friend, don't worry about. People are so worried about their friends. Forget your stupid friends. They're, <laughs> they leave them. Alone. You don't need them um, in in your um, in your world right now. You need to focus the on your world, the AP world, history world. Yeah, you just focus on your, your AP world for you. Your world is a world of one person alone. 45 minutes, five minutes to submit. You just focus on that um, and you focus on getting these points. So you start that intro paragraph with the context and thesis. Again, guys, those of you who are just joining, these are great questions and comments we're getting. If you like this, like what you're seeing, like this video and definitely go subscribe to Antisocial Studies, Emily's channel. She's got all the great videos on each of the points of the rubric and her website, antisocialstudies.org um, mm -hmm. is the place to be for the incredible amount of stuff that you've put out. You link right to the marker learning site. So it's super easy to find our study packs, your practice tests, our practice tests, this awesome rubric. Now yeah. tell me about this chart here in the middle. And it, you said two to three paragraphs, but as you said earlier, it could be any number. Yeah. This is what I give my students. I will say, actually, if it's okay with you, I kind of want to skip down to outside evidence because oh, a yeah. lot of kids get confused between context and outside evidence. And so I think it's kind of helpful to talk about the two of those at the same time. Yeah. And I did a whole video on this where I show like really specific examples. But in general, if you have um, a prompt, let's let's take that prompt I was using before, evaluate the impact of European ideologies on imperialism in the 19th century. So the parameters of your prompt that the College Board is saying, like these are the lanes you have to stay in, are European ideologies, imperialism, and the 19th century. So all of your evidence, documents, and outsider additional evidence all have to fit those parameters. So your evidence has to be related to European ideologies and imperialism in the 19th century. So that's, I think the word outside confuses people. I want to start calling it like additional evidence because additional evidence means it still fits what the prompt is asking you to talk about completely. It checks all those boxes. Whereas context is like, like I said, you zoom out of one of those things. So you might zoom out and talk about non-European ideologies and imperialism, or you might talk about something else besides imperialism that's impacted by that. Or you might talk about a different time period. So that's sort of the distinction between the two is if you think about like the keywords of the prompt and like the rules of the prompt, all of your evidence, when you use your documents, when you bring in outside evidence, all of that has to fit the rules of that prompt context is the one is the only point in this whole 10 point rubric where you can kind of go outside of it you can go to another time period go to another region so if it specifies latin america then you're talking about latin america context is the only time where you can like venture to other parts of the world and talk about it hopefully that makes sense yeah absolutely that's interesting now tell me about open book open note for a minute because here's the thing like People, everyone who took Euro and A push, teachers, students, they've been talking a lot about people running out of time. Yeah. And do, 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 I'm going to go down on uh, Wikipedia. Oh, look at that. Ooh, oh, clickety clackety. And you end up lost and you've burned a lot of time. Now, I get using Wikipedia, which, by the way, here's what's not cheating any books, any notes, any website that is not collaborative. Here's what is cheating social media sites a group discussion board, anything where other people are up in your Google Doc, like editing, that's all cheating. Don't do that. So, but that that openness of the internet is actually this huge trap. Yeah. Um, so what are you recommending people do with open book, open note? 
So I'm recommending that you have like your curated notes. I've been giving some examples or some suggestions on what those could look like, but your curated notes, those, the Marco Learning Unit Study Guides are great. You could really just have those to kind of have the basics. If you need to go to the internet, what I've been telling my own students is you shouldn't have to click on anything. So if Google can answer it for you, then it's fine. So I'll yeah. even show you on the screen. Like, let's say you're looking at a document and it's set in British India and it's in 1863. And you're like, wait, when was the Sepoy Rebellion? Was this before or after the Sepoy Rebellion? Sure, go to a tab and say Sepoy uh, Rebellion year. And then you pull up and Google answers it. Hey, oh, great, this document was after the Sepoy Rebellion. Now you can do like a historical situation of that document, right? Like that I think is an amazing use of the internet. Same thing, if you're like trying to remember someone's name, you're like, who was the, uh, let's see, who was the diamond guy from South Africa? He was British, what was that guy's name? And then you're like, uh, somewhere you're gonna scroll down and maybe see, oh, Cecil Rhodes, that was his name. And then you go back. So I'm sort of advising my kids to not click on anything. Like if it, if it can be answered by like the little Wikipedia preview or Google or something, that's awesome. But if you're having to go further than that, you don't know it and you shouldn't be writing about it. So I think that's really great advice. One other um, thing that I, I realized last week is this, the course and exam description is yeah. a, a very interesting thing to think about for a second here, right? Because if you just have that downloaded and yes. you have like a certain word, you can command F, yes. control F and like find something real quick. Um, this is what I've been saying. So this is what like, if you go again to my website, World History Resources, I simplified and made it look a little prettier and easier to find. But yeah, you can just download the PDF of the course description, which is literally point by point, like here's what students should know. So if you go here, this is the first thing I say you should have with you when you take the AP test is the CED. And I made um, just like a simplified version um, that you can download, but it's the same stuff. I've even kind of bolded some terms, but this is what the College Board is telling you. Like they say, you should be able to explain the systems of government employed by the Chinese by proving that the Song Dynasty used Confucianism and bureaucracy and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't always have that much detail, but yeah, like this should get you, if you have to go beyond this, I mean, you can, you can write your whole essay bringing in outside evidence from here. The trick is if you haven't studied, you're not gonna know where, what you're looking for, right? So I think that's the trick is where it's still beneficial to study the content the way you would for any test, because then you'll know exactly what you're looking for. You might just have to go look up the phrase or look up the name or whatever. Right. So if you see a source that's, I mean, the, I guess the way to do it, yeah, you, you actually have to know things to do well in AP exams, like even in the crazy year that we're in, like you, AP exams are the one exam that you, one system of exams that are just like you, like if you or I right now took AP Calculus BC, mm, bloodbath, right? And we're smart AP people. English and even, like AP English, I would fail. Yeah. No, no, you, I'm sure you do great, but, but like the, you actually have to know stuff and have skills and like know how to do the, 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 the things that they're asking. You actually have to know stuff here, but you don't have to be like a walking jeopardy, like repository of information. You right. see a Confucian source, command F Confucian. You see something about like Atlantic slave trade, command F slave. And, and it might take you to parts of the CED or of your simplified guide, which I think is amazing to kind of find that information. So Emily, so far we've talked about context, thesis, and outside evidence. That's four of the points. Mm -hmm. Where should we go next? I mean, obviously the main part is using the documents, right? And so I'm seeing good questions in the chat. And this is something everyone's been asking about of like, do I have to tie blank back to my thesis? And the answer is always yes. So the answer is like all of these points have to serve your argument. So like if you're talking about European imperialism and you're like, Fun fact, Europe used to be feudal. And then you just move on. It's like, well, that's not context because that doesn't relate to what you're arguing at all. Same thing with outside evidence. If you're just throwing in some other thing, Britain also conquered Australia. Cool, but like you have to have that and so, right? So that's what I always tell my students. You, you identify whether that's the context or you identify the point of view or you identify a piece of outside evidence. You kind of identify it first and then you have a second sentence where you say, and so, and that links it back to whatever argument that you're making. So this is where when you get to your body paragraphs, 
which you don't, I guess, technically have to have. You could just talk about each document on its own. I think having a strong topic sentence is really helpful. Um, so having a really clear focus for that paragraph, even though there's no point for a topic sentence, because you can keep reminding yourself, like everything I say, I need to make sure I clearly link it back to whatever I'm supposed to be talking about. And so that's mostly true for the documents. And that's really the difference between just addressing a document and supporting an argument. I think like the easiest way to try to ensure that you get the extra points for actually supporting an argument is to have a clear topic sentence so the grader knows what your argument is. Yeah, you know, and I remember, um, Emily, the day that the rubrics dropped, like our world is so weird, like where we're like, oh, the college board's going to drop a rubric and like we actually care, like what is wrong with us? We need to go on vacation somewhere like Tom, you, me, the whole Marco Learning team, we just need to like go get a life. And anyway, <laughs> we really cared. And that morning, you and Tom Ritchie were talking and I was, we were all kind of in this like four part conversation and we <laughs> were like, oh, you could write a really successful DBQ with only two documents. Yeah. Let's talk about why and how and, and should I, but I still want to go, I want to get a perfect score. So should I get, yeah. do all five documents? Like, what do I do? You should not do all five documents. You just shouldn't. Like there's, there's no reason to, and it's not worth your time, but that's fine. If you want to be a perfectionist, that's okay. If it's for your ego, but really like you get, there's three document points. Um, and so I'm going to pull up my little, my little annotation tool. So basically if you, let's say you just address document one and document three, which really just kind of means you're describing the document accurately. It's just like document one is a picture of a fort where the Dutch had a thing in the Southeast Asia and the Dutch were there, um, but you're not connecting it to anything. You already get a point for that. Literally just describing two documents successfully, obviously in your own words, you already get a point for that. But then if you connect those documents to your argument or to your topic sentence, you then get another point. And still you've only used two documents. That of course means that we're advising you should use three because that way if you screw one up, you're fine, right? Because you don't want to accidentally misread a document and now you've lost two points on a rubric that's a big deal, right? The only other point that you can get is if you use four documents or five, you can get one additional point. But basically my argument is you should start out only using three documents and then you should spend your time trying to get context and two outside evidence points and two hit points. Then if at the end, if you've run out of things to talk about and you're like, I can't think of any other outside evidence, sure, then go back and add in a fourth document to try for that extra point. But I think what's gonna happen to a lot of students is they're gonna be so focused on using four documents and figuring out how to organize them and how to explain them that they're gonna use up a ton of time just trying to get one extra point when they could have used that time other places more easily. That's exactly right. This is this is game theory at its, at its core, which is like, everyone is like, I'm gonna go for 10. You actually like in going for 10, waste time and get six out of 10 or five yeah. out of 10. If you go for eight, you have a better shot of hitting that. And yes, if you're luxuriating in 12 and a half minutes at the end, guys, reclining in your chair, typing it, then add in the other documents. But through smart strategy says, get if all the points are each one out of 10, but some are easier to get than others, stack the easiest ones first. Yeah. Reaching for several more documents and jamming all that in is just overkill. So that's a really yeah. great strategy. And I'm seeing um, some students asking about like, do we have to group the documents? How many groups should we have? It doesn't, it literally doesn't matter. Like it really, you don't have to have any groups. There used to be a point a long time ago for grouping the documents, there's not anymore. So in theory, like paragraph one could be document one proves this. And then paragraph two could be document three proves this. Like, and, and obviously that's not gonna get you complexity. There's some other things you probably won't get, but you'll get those points. Um, if you are, I advise my students to try to have um, two body paragraphs. I just advise them to try to say, because um, there's typically the, the prompt will kind of lend itself to that. And there will typically be out of those five documents kind of two themes, right? That you can pick up on and say, okay, th these one or two go together. These one or two go together. So you end up with two body paragraphs. But in theory, it, it's like the Wild West. There's no points for how you organize your DBQ. 
Yeah, that's the thing. So uh, we can actually answer six questions at once here. Do I need a conclusion? How many paragraphs should I have? Do I have to group the documents? What, how long should my introduction be? What about grammarly and style? What about, stop it. This is no, not, it's a shame because you both, um, you know, what's interesting about you, Emily, and, and me is we both studied, we went to graduate school to study history of the Spanish speaking world in the, I did, I did late middle ages, you did the early modern period, incredible, really interesting um, uh, stuff. And we focused on like writing well, or at least researching really well. And, mm -hmm. and the best, um, I studied with a, um, a scholar named Sabina McCormick who wrote this beautiful, um, like poetic kind of historical texts about the new world. And like, that's, not what this exam is really dealing with. No. The exam is a like point by point game. And you, you should think about it in that way. I wish it was real history and you were all like publishing research, but like it's this, get the points. That's and the good the news about that is that what it's doing is that it does sort of equalize the playing field to where you don't have to be a good writer to get a 10 out of 10. I will say complexity is kind of hard to get if you're not like a pretty decent writer, but um, so it really is about what you know. And so it doesn't have to, I tell my students whenever they turn in an essay for my class, you're turning in your first draft and then you're just not doing a second draft. Like, and the graders also understand that this is your first draft of an essay. If you had your way, you would then take it and edit it and make it look better, but they're gonna be understanding of that. So in terms of all of those formatting questions, how many paragraphs, how many sentences, it's really, this is a checklist. Right. And it's like, once you've done it, you've done it. So I was grading a student's DBQ with her the other day and she had two amazing first sentences at the beginning. Um, or I think she had three. I read all three and I went, you already have a two. Like you could stop now and have a two because you have context and thesis. She can't then lose those points later on because the rest of her essay is garbage or something. Right. Yeah. And one, one point somebody's bringing up here in the, in the chat grouping. So a lot of teachers still teach grouping and it's because yeah. it makes for better writing and like clumping together. If you want to put two documents in one paragraph and another, if you're going after that complexity point. Now, before we get to complexity, we covered what about the hip? What is hip? What is sourcing? How do I get that? Do I have to talk about yeah. H's and P's? And yeah, everyone freaks out about the hip point. And it's one of those that like, once you get it, you get it. And it's just like this moment where you're like, oh, so I'll try to, I feel like I've explained this in 3 million different ways. And hopefully one of them, one of them resonates with you because it's really actually not as hard as people, I think students sometimes think it is. All they want to know is that you can read between the lines of a document. Like all they want to know is that you're not reading a letter by Columbus talking about how stupid the natives are. And you're like, oh, I guess the natives were really stupid. Like that's all they're looking for. They're just looking for you understanding that like every document that exists in the history of the world is in some way affected by who's writing it, when it's being written. And so there's gonna be parts of it that might not be totally wrong. They might be exaggerated. There might be things that are emphasized. So that's all they wanna know is that you're not just taking these documents at face value. Like, well, I guess all the natives were dumb and deserved to be conquered. Like, no, that was Columbus. He was trying to convince someone to help him do that. So what they're looking for is that, and here's where you can get partial credit. So like you can hip just one document and get a point. So try it, right? You don't have to do both to get both points. So HIP stands for what the College Board has told us. They say you evaluate one of these four things, the historical situation, the intended audience, the purpose or the point of view, or a mix of those. Sometimes like intended audience and purpose blend together. That's totally fine. So what that means is historical situation is like I said, if you have a document that is a British governor describing how are we gonna get more weapons into the Indus River region, and you see the document was written three years after the Sepoy Rebellion, you go, hey, here's why he's so concerned about guns and protecting British soldiers is because they just had a rebellion, right? That's you situating the document within its time period and understanding that you really get it. Historical situation is context, but it's context that's super specific to that document. So you can't just do your general, your bigger picture context you did at the beginning. You want to do it specific for that document. Um, so if you don't know what was going on, then don't pick that one. Uh, intended audience and purpose often go together, right? It's like, especially if you get a letter, like a letter to a king is always like, hip that one, do intended audience. They're talking to a king. They're going to suck up to them. They're going to be diplomatic, whatever. So all you're showing is that then you might want to pick out some phrases. Like you see a letter from an African king to a Portuguese king that's saying, please stop stealing our people. 
but asking that very nicely, well, you might talk about the intended audience. Of course, he's not going to actually be super, you know, angry in his letter about the slave trade. He's trying to keep a relationship so he doesn't get conquered. But so that might change the way we see some of the language. Maybe they weren't as friendly as the king of the Congo was making it seem. Um, and that's the same with point of view. If you, you really should only do point of view if you either know the person who's writing it or they have a clear role. So if you just get a random person that you've never heard of and it doesn't say what their job is, then don't do point of view because you're just guessing. But if you get like Christopher Columbus or you get like a Christian missionary or something, then you can really look through their lens and say, why would the Christian missionary be focusing so much effort on trying to get the British to conquer these islands? Oh, well, he can go set up missions and convert people, right? So all HIP is doing is like, you understand the gray area in between the documents and you're not taking it at face value. And then however you can kind of explain that, I mean, explain how that helps us better understand what is in the document, that, that's, that's what HIP is. If Sorry, that's one. So let's say, Emily, um, I spent 90% of my time inside like the documents, like just, I got lost, I went back, I wrote my thesis, I changed my thesis, I changed my mind. Um, I have 11 minutes left. Mm -hmm. I've earned thesis and contextualization. I started my first body paragraph. Mm -hmm. Do I go after outside evidence or HIP or does it depend? Um, what I would do, so let's say you've written a beautiful intro that took you 20 minutes to write, right? Um, so you have context thesis. Um, I, would, I would get two documents down very clearly, right? That's, that's the baseline is like thesis, at least two documents connected to your thesis is like, you kind of got to do that. So let's say then you're like, oh shoot, I only have 15 minutes left and I have a three or maybe a four. Um, it kind of depends. You can take two strategies. It really depends on the document. Some students are really good at HIP and they just kind of get it. And there also will be some documents that will be really clear where you'll see a point of view and it's like, oh, this is clearly like a racist dude who's trying to justify conquering a continent or whatever. And so if that's the case, go for HIP. But in general, I do think outside evidence is a little bit more um, straightforward for students, especially since you have your notes. So in that case, I just want to clarify, right, that outside evidence just means you're basically bringing in what could be another document. document Obviously, you're not fixed. writing an actual document, but it's like whatever piece of evidence you have could have been doc six in this essay, um, and you're just kind of bringing it in to still support your argument. And so I really think that one's more straightforward and you often have to do a little less work for that one. You can often just like identify the thing that happened and then have one sentence connecting it back to your topic sentence and you get the point. So that's where I would go first, unless there's a hip that's like kind of obvious to you. Yeah, and we're getting some questions about what, where this document is. So I just wanted to, we got some new people oh, yeah. coming in. I want to welcome everyone to um, our walkthrough of this AP World. Uh, rubric let's get the um let's get the uh yeah there's the link up there it's antisocialstudies.org this is where you're going to find everything that you want we've got our, your zoom shoop parody um <laughs> under ap world history exam resources where emily's clicking you can find not only the link to her youtube channel which you should subscribe to and go watch right after this be a nerd and go watch her, <laughs> her videos breaking down each of these points um, as well as her other reviews, she's going live tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 3 p.m. Central, respect to Austin. Um, and the um, and you've got all those resources as well as this rubric, as well as a link to your condensed CED. CED is course and exam description. I attended a summer workshop on um, AP World History this year, um, which was six hours of fun. And um, this is the official exam, uh, that, that you, exam description, the course curriculum that uh, you've broken down as well there. So tons and tons of resources on antisocialstudies.org. If you've liked this video so far, if you like what's going on, press the like button, subscribe to our channel, um, and let us know what questions you had. There was one very important question um, that I wanted to highlight. Um, Jack, it was Jack Kelly's, I think, was about how do you tie the hip back to the argument in the thesis? Is that like a sentence? How does yeah. that work for outside evidence? And yeah, so um, so again, in general, right, you, you need the and so. And so for like additional evidence or for the document, right, you would say in document two, we see a 
Dutch fort in Southeast Asia. Um, great. And so um, that fort is fortified and looks pretty militaristic. And so that shows us that there was some competition for resources in Southeast Asia, whatever, like whatever your topic sentence is, you kind of identify the part of the root, the part of the document or the part, the piece of evidence that you think is crucial. And then you have another sentence that does like, and so that shows you kind of walk us through it again. Like how does that then connect back to the topic sentence or the thesis you wrote? With HIP, what I encourage my kids to do is like, you identify the intended audience or whatever, and then you do the end. So this is how it like helps us understand this document better. So if we see the letter from Columbus describing the natives and we identify that like, well, he's writing to the King of Spain, he wants money. And so he's probably exaggerating just how nice and accommodating the natives were and wanting to emphasize their weakness so that the king will give him more money to go back, right? So the and so part of HIP is a little bit of like, what does that matter? Like, why does it, if you, you can't just say this is biased, you say, well, this, this part of it's problematic. So we should probably, this part, we might want to read with a little bit of a grain of salt. So it's just kind of showing you're connecting it kind of back to the document itself. If you can then connect it to your argument too, that's, that's the strongest. Um, but they're typically, I think, a little bit nicer on HIP than they are outside evidence because it's HIP, I think, is a, is a tough point and it's kind of a nuanced thing. So just do your best at making sure, like I kind of tell my students, if you think you've explained it, maybe write one more sentence in a different way and then move on. Okay. And another thing we're getting, Emily, in the questions here is about... Um, complexity, right? Like yeah. people are so obsessed with this. Why, what is it, what's a, a you know what good a good analogy is? In the world of college admissions where I've done a lot of my work is people are so obsessed with like what Harvard's doing. Yeah. Like there are 3,200 and something something colleges in America and yeah. they're not all Harvard. Um, so people are like, well, what Harvard's doing? Well, you know, Harvard is one very particular example. The complexity <laughs> point is just one of the 10 points. It gets a disproportionate number of attention. Why should I not focus on trying to get this point? Because it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard to get. Like, it's so hard to get that I can't even explain how to get it. And I'm not saying that that means some of you out there won't get it, but you're not going to know. Like, it's one of those things that students just, you either do it or you don't. And that, I think complexity is one of the only points that you can get kind of lucky and you can get a prompt that you just happen to know a lot about and you can make these connections. But um, I agree with you, John, that you were saying there are going to be kids out there who are going to shoot for a 10 and end up with a five, right? Because they're trying so hard to get this one or to use all five documents and do complexity. They're trying so hard for these two that they actually don't explain their other points well and they don't get what they think they're getting. Um, I will say just because everyone's always curious, right? What I kind of tell my students about complexity is you're kind of constantly and the key is constant you can't get complexity for like one phrase or one one part of a paragraph it has to be throughout your essay basically i've seen complexity through people answering the question why like why or how did this thing happen so if you assert something you say japan rapidly industrialized much more successfully than china and then you say and here's why here's why japan was more prepared and more ready and blah 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 and then you keep doing that throughout the essay or how you're really clearly like using those skills of like causation or change over time to really walk the reader through like this is exactly how industrialization led to imperialism. And again, you're doing that throughout. The other thing that I kind of like for complexity is, is showing like exceptions to the rule or counter arguments, right? So again, if you're gonna say like, um, you know, the scramble for Africa and the vast majority of Africa, blah, blah, blah. However, Ethiopia, let's talk about Ethiopia because they actually stayed independent and why did that happen? So again, it's just showing that you understand nuance and you understand that history isn't black and white, it's more complex. But it's just like what that looks like is totally different for every prompt. And it's, I'm just gonna be mean about this. It's not something you're gonna figure out how to do in the next two days. So just like you can figure out how to do HIP or evidence or read documents better in the next two days you can't figure out how to do complexity on an essay you don't know yet in two days. 
Amen. Uh, I think <laughs> that really well. And you know, one of the things that we've done here, if we can go back, could you go back to the um, the tab for AP World History exam yeah. resources on your page? And mm -hmm. just again, walk everyone through this because people are asking. So there's the link to your YouTube channel. There's your, your distilled CED. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the, the study guides, which is number three there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, those are the Marco Learning Study Guides that are kind of like just shiny cheat sheets that are there for you that aren't cheating because you're allowed to use them. Right. The other thing, yeah, I'm glad you're going to this page because I also want to show the, the guide here, which was a little bit, it just breaks down a little bit of the strategy that we've gone over. And we've covered this in other videos. Um, as you scroll down, um, you can see the, um, the, the study packs for um, world history. And then this, that, that guide right up there, sorry, mm. it's just taking a while. If you scroll up, ah. hold on. And then I'm looking at the annotation guide in the middle here. Um, so there it is. Download your free practice guide for the new DBQ. What's great about that document, and we don't have to go through it right now, but it's oh, just- Oh yeah, I can also put in my email. Yeah, to put it, just to point out that it's, it breaks down some of this approach. Um, Emily, Tom Ritchie and I kind of conspired and we're like, wait a second, here's kind of a six point strategy, an eight point strategy, or and a 10 point strategy. Um, so definitely check out antisocialstudies.org. It links right into here. You can get all kind of resources, guys. But as you said, the exam is what? Less than 48 hours away. You're not gonna relearn all of history. You're not gonna get, a, you're not gonna go from a one to five. You're not gonna learn complexity in five seconds. The goal that you're setting for yourself is to prepare yourself mentally to perform the best you can. Have a strategy, stick to it. What are some of the other advice that you give to, to students at this point? so late in the game. Yeah, I mean, I saw someone talking about how it's like super crazy to ask kids to write an essay in 45 minutes. And like, part of me says yes, but then part of me says it's really actually kind of a generous thing. And I'll tell you why, because, well, first of all, on the old DBQ, like on the original test, you were only gonna get what, an hour, right? And you had two whole extra documents and other things you had to do. So it's actually really not that different than what you've probably been practicing in class. But the reason why it's kind of generous is because you can get so bogged down, world history is so vast that like you can get so bogged down in details that are useless to you um, and just totally like lose the forest, what is it? Lose the forest through the trees. Um, and so 45 minutes does a few things. It makes it harder to cheat, right? It makes it harder to just go on the internet and do a bunch of research right then and find stuff. So it really is going to highlight the kids who know what they're talking about. But it also should kind of relieve you of any stress that this has to be a good essay. I'm <laughs> like, really, this doesn't have to be a good essay. This doesn't have to be an essay that you're going to send to colleges to show them what a good writer you are. Like, this really is an opportunity to just prove what you know. Um, and so, like John was saying, I think going in with a strategy, and really the way you should think of it is like, what's at least two points you're just going to ignore? You're just going to pretend they don't exist. For me, I would just pretend complexity doesn't exist. And I would maybe forget that the extra document point, like for using four documents exists, unless I was bored with five minutes left. And then I would go, all right, okay, I'll throw in another document. Because then it just decreases that stress. A lot of people are asking about like, what's gonna be a five? And we don't know, like that's, I've gotten that question a million times in the last week and we just don't know. But I can tell you that you're not gonna need a 10, right? You're not gonna need a 10 and I don't no. think you're gonna need a nine. Um, and so, like John was saying, if you shoot for a 10, you're going to run out of time and you're going to end up with a five. But if you shoot for an eight and you're practicing shooting for an eight and you end up with a seven or an eight or a six, I think you're in a lot better shape. Yeah, that's a great, I, I think that's the overall, like the overarching point of today's session was to say, go through this rubric, look at it. I'll, I would add, Emily, or a different response we could say is it's not really an essay. Um, this It's like, it's you know, it's a particular type of task with mm -hmm. uh, with particular points that are lined up. They're essay-like components to be sure, but it doesn't have to gel and cohere in a holistic way. When I took a push 20 years ago, um, and back then it was a holistic rubric, which is like you created a vibe and like the overall vibe that I created was good enough to get a good score on that exam. But I was, I was trying to be eloquent. I was trying to connect the essay in a beautiful way. Beauty gets you zero points on this exam. Mm -hmm. um, the per unity and completeness and essay likeness gets you isn't a point either. So yeah. um, it's it's a very important point, and that's why we're getting some of these great questions here about pacing. That's that's the most important thing. People who took the exams last week, here's what they did. That here are the mistakes from last week. Top three mistakes. Everyone ready? 
Uh, they waited till there was 12 seconds left to, to press the submit button. Don't do that. Thousands of people could not submit their exams. Do not do that. When there's five minutes left, you click submit, get it uploaded. Uh, another big mistake people made is they just misallocated their time. So practice. Emily's got content on antisocialstudies.org. We have a free practice test on our website. We have videos on this channel where Emily walks through writing practice test DBQs. How to, what, that kind of torture you did on behalf of the WAP community of America um, is crazy in the world. I'm doing it tomorrow. I'm doing another one tonight. I'm going to write the College Board just released a practice test a five document DBQ finally. And so I'm gonna just record myself. I have not looked at the essay yet. I'm gonna record myself, time it 45 minutes, read it and write a, write a DBQ. And I'm gonna post it on my YouTube page tomorrow morning, whether it's good or not. So if you're curious, like to watch someone who has a master's degree in history struggle through a DBQ, that'll maybe make you feel a little, a little better. Right. Yes. And if you, um, those of you who are taking Lang, um, who were just in my Lang session, watch me like multiple times, like, I don't know what to say. Um, and just we're trying to write live on air. So guys, this has been, it's been so great. We've got so many great questions and comments. Um, definitely check out a Emily's website, antisocialstudies.org with her list of YouTube videos. Definitely check out um, some of the videos I put up for exam day tips. I have a tech problems video, the email backup submission option video, some, some things to help you overcoming anxiety on test day. Like, and the number one point is like perfectionism push perfectionism out of the way yeah. and do your best work. Any other final tips, Emily, for all the wonderful people in the room tonight? Yeah, I mean, I will say um, one thing I've been having my students do is if they're worried about pacing is set up some alarms on their phone. You can do that now. Um, so like our test starts at 1 p.m. for us. And so I've been telling them like, okay, we'll set an alarm for 120 that says like, stop, reread the prompt, right? Set an alarm for 140 that says five minutes left. Set an alarm for 145 that says upload. Because again, you don't want to be like not looking at the timer and you run at whatever. So if you already know your pacing and where you want to be, don't set a million alarms. That'll stress you out. But you can set a few to like stop and kind of jolt you awake and go, right, what am I doing? And the other thing, like John was saying, I all year in my classroom, I tell my kids math does not exist in WAP. It just doesn't. Like math doesn't exist in WAP. And so that's where you can see down here where I allocate grades when my students write a DBQ. If they get a 10, they get a 100. If they get a nine, they get a 99. <laughs> if they get an eight, they're still getting an A. If they get a seven, they're still getting an A, right? Like really like a four, a five, a six are all good grades. So again, math doesn't exist in WAP. It's not like they're gonna go, well, you got a 10, so that's a five and you got an eight, so that's a four. Um, so really it's about like the people that are gonna be rewarded on this test are the people who've prepared and the people who know their strengths and know what they're good at and know what to just kind of let go and, and not focus on so much. Um, so yeah, and, and if nothing else, like you're gonna be done, right? And, and uh, what I really do like to say, although I'm starting to like make my livelihood off of like these standardized tests is that these are, these are not like the end all be all. I do actually legitimately like as a historian think the DBQ is a pretty good judge of your historical skills. Like I actually really like this DBQ. So people who are like, this doesn't seem fair for it to just be the DBQ. I actually think this DBQ encompasses everything I've been trying to teach my kids all year, all in one thing. And so I actually think this is a great judge of like your historical skills but it's not the end all be all. And so if you get a four or five, that's awesome. You can brag about it. If you get a three, that's amazing. If you get a two or a one, you don't have to tell anyone and only you and your teacher will know and your teacher's probably really nice. So it'll be fine. Great. And Emily, we just got a question. Some people are asking for the link to the new DBQ that they've released. Is that in AP Classroom? Well, here's the that? thing. I had to get it sent to me, like DM'd to me on Instagram by a student who, who had it. Wow. So I'm now gonna have to go find, I've been searching on College Board for a practice DBQ for weeks. And then I saw a student was asking about like, can you write the one they just released? And I've, I'm still struggling to find it. So I will, um, I will make sure that I'm allowed to post it on my website, post the link to the one I have. Okay, um, we'll, and then we'll if so, yeah. I'll, I'll put it up there, so. That's right. We'll, we'll, if we're allowed to post the link, guys, that's what we'll do. We're going to upload this video to our channel. You've got, we've got several other videos on our channel. Check those out. If you've liked this uh, video, press that like button, subscribe to our channel. And I really just want to thank you, Emily, for spending another hour of your life suffering through world history 
um, things with all of us. And thank everyone who's who was so great in the chat, asking great questions, being really positive. Um, good vibes only. That's the only way through this, guys. We've got to just like focus on what we can control, do the best we can, and definitely reach out to us if you guys have any problems or, or questions. And uh, thank you, guys. We'll end the stream here.